Hello and welcome back. This ba call is being publicly streamed. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the Real English Party Online Tuesday Afternoon Book Club. The days are getting shorter, so it looks like this afternoon book club is starting to turn into an early evening book club, if you know what I mean. So I apologize. Last week, we were not able to uh, broadcast a live stream because it was my birthday and I had some trouble receiving a present that was sent to me. My partner had sent me a new bed, which was really great. Uh, however, the delivery process was a little bit mixed up. And so I had to be available to receive it. Didn't receive it that day, actually. Had to receive it the next day. And then, of course, then the evening book club had to be canceled because the mem members could not make it. So uh, it looked like it was just a day of celebration in the form of me sitting, watching YouTube videos, and uh, trying to respond to Facebook comments for my birthday. So uh, yeah, so now a newly refreshed 50-year-old Justin is going to read for you uh, at the Real English Party online book club. Uh, we're, we're, we're reading Stephen King's fairy tale. And uh, I apologize, we are actually starting about 30 minutes late, and I'll try to go as, as late as 4.30. Well, this might be a little bit short today. But uh, let's just do a brief review of what happened last time. It was two weeks ago, so I don't really remember. But I, I do recall, not the details, but that, yes, the fairy tale aspect of this has kicked in. We know Mr. Bowditch has died, and our hero, Charlie, has taken over his property. Not officially yet, but uh, definitely has been uh, catching up on things. He listened to a cassette tape. I think the last time was that was that was what the whole part was was reading what Mr. Bowditch had recorded on a cassette tape, basically advising him of a hole in the bottom of a shed outside in the backyard that led to a tunnel that led to another world, perhaps, or another time, perhaps. It looks like there's some place where apparently the insects and animals are much bigger. And in this place, that's where uh, Mr. Bowditch somehow was able to procure, procure those, those gold pellets. Procure just means get, if you didn't know. And uh, that's pretty much what, what, what's happened. Uh, Mr. Bowditch is basically leaving this portal to another world uh, to Charlie's care. And uh, we can only assume, since this is a book called Fairy Tale, that the adventure will begin as Charlie goes down the portal and into this other world. So this is where, where the plot really kicks in. Uh, it's still not too late to join, actually, because we're really just getting started on the story. Up until now, it's all been just background. We, we found out about Charlie's family. We know about Mr. Bowditch a little bit. We also now know that Mr. Bowditch is much older than he appeared to be when he died. That he uh, actually, something about this world or in this world had kept him alive much longer than he should have been. He was actually pretending to be his own son or grandson, if I'm not mistaken. So now the story is just beginning. If you were to join in on the book club now, you would then be really starting to starting to get a, an awareness of what this story is really about. Uh, of course, you can watch the previous book club events by going to my previous events on the, on the, on the, on the event calendar. And you can actually see the, the live or recorded streaming of previous readings. You could actually read up to this very chapter, chapter 11, if you like. But uh, what I do recommend uh, is that uh, you join in. Uh, and and uh, if you want to join in live on the, on the day of the live streaming, you can uh, probably go to the web page. By that time, I'll have a little link that you can link that you can click and just join right in. Uh, if you want to you know, set up a paid uh, attendance, then we can take this event offline so you can pre preserve your privacy. It's free if you join on the day, and you can take it private if you want to pay the, I think it was 1,000 yen or something like that. But let's get started, yeah, shall we? Because we got a late start, so we want to jump right into this. Okay, so chapter 11, the title is, That Night, School Days, Dad Leaves. The well of the worlds, the other, 
the old woman a nasty surprise. Are you all right, Charlie? I looked up from my book. I've been deep into it. I would have said nothing could take my mind off the tape I'd listened to in Mr. Bowditch's kitchen, the one that was now hidden on the top shelf of my closet under a stack of old shirts. But this one had, this one, which I'd taken from Mr. Bowditch's bedroom, had conjured its own world. Radar was sleeping beside me, occasionally giving out with little snores. Huh? I asked if you're all right. You hardly touched your dinner, and you've seemed off all evening, thinking about Mr. Bowditch? Well, yeah, it was the truth, although not exactly the way Dad thought. You miss him? I do, a lot. I reached down and stroked Radar's neck. My dog now, my dog, my responsibility. That's okay. That's the, the way it should be. Are you going to be okay next week? Sure. Why? He gave me the sort of patient sigh, which I think maybe only dads can give. The retreat. I told you about it. You had your mind on other things, I guess. I leave Tuesday morning for a four-day wonderful... I leave Tuesday morning for four wonderful days in the North Woods. It's an overland gig. But Lindy wangled me an invitation to come along. Plenty of seminars on liability, which will be merely okay, and some on vetting fraudulent claims, which is a big deal, especially for a firm just getting on its feet. Like yours, like mine. Also, bonding exercises. He rolled his eyes. Will there be drinking? There will, a lot, but not by me. Are you gonna be okay on your own? Sure, assuming I didn't get lost in what Mr. Bowditch claimed was a very dangerous city ruled over by a sleeping God. Assuming I went at all. I'll be fine. If anything comes up, I'll call you. You're smiling. Something funny? Just that I'm not 10 anymore, Dad. Actually, what made me smile, smile was wondering if there was a cell service in the well of the world. I was guessing Verizon hadn't opened that territory yet. Sure, there's nothing I could help you with. Oh, wait, no, one more time. Let me read that again. Tone was wrong. Sure, there's nothing I can help you with? Tell him, I thought. Nope, all good. What's a bonding exercise? I'll show you. Get up. He got up himself. Now stand behind me. I put my book on the chair and stood behind him. We're supposed to trust the team, Dad said. Not that I actually have one, being a one-man show, but I can be a good sport. We climb trees with a... <clears throat> trees? You climb trees? Oh, many overland retreats, sometimes completely sober, with a spotter. We'll all do it except for Willie Deegan, who has a pacemaker. Jesus, Dad. And we do this. He fell backward with no warning, his hands loosely clasped at his waist. I wasn't playing sports anymore, but there was nothing wrong with my reflexes. I caught him easily, looking at him upside down. I saw his eyes were closed and he was smiling. I loved him for that smile. I gave him a heave and he went back on his feet. Radar was looking at us. She made a rough sound and put her head back down. I'll have to trust every whoever is behind me. It'll probably be Norm Richards, but I trust you more, Charlie. We're bonded. That's great, Dad, but don't fall out of any trees. Taking care of one guy who took a fall is my limit. Now, can I read my book? Go for it. He picked it up off the chair and looked at the cover. One of Mr. Bowditch's? Yes. I read it when I was your age, maybe even younger. Crazy Carnival comes to a little town right here, right here in Illinois, as I remember. Cougar and Dark's Pandemonium Shadow Show. All I remember is that there was a blind fortune teller 
She was creepy. Yeah, the dust witch is mondo creepy, all right. You read, I'll watch television and rot my brain. Just don't give yourself any nightmares. If I sleep at all, I thought. Okay, so let's see. Let me go to the, the, the front of this plot. There was not too much to teach to, except for things like, you know, it's in, in that first page, it said this one which I'd taken from Mr. Bodich's bedroom. He's talking about the book. He said, it conjured its own world. So maybe you, you, you might not have seen the words like conjure, right? If we were in a book club together, well, that's what I would teach you. What does the word conjure mean? And the word conjure means to create or to make manifest or to make real, usually in some magical way, right? So he's using that sort of cre creatively and poetically saying that the book conjured its own world, right? And of course, you probably could have guessed that if, if, you, if you were watching Harry Potter movie or something like that, and we waved this wand and made something appear, that would be he conjured something. That's what the real meaning means. But in this case, it just means it created its own world. This book did, that is. There wasn't much else on this page that I want to teach to. Uh, in fact, this part doesn't have too much, um, too much advanced vocabulary. Things like liability is really a specialized term. But as we know, uh, Charlie's dad works in the insurance claim business. So he, he, he investigates insurance claims. And so what happens with insurance is uh, when, when a, an accident happens, the insurance company has to decide who is liable. Liable means who is to blame, whose fault is it? So when someone is liable, that means they did something wrong to cause it to the accident. And so the noun form of this adjective liable is liability. So he's going to attend a retreat with seminars on liability relating to his job. And he was also going to attend the retreat, a seminar relating to vetting fraudulent claims, right? So here, you may not know what this word vetting means. It's not something that happens, that comes across in textbooks, right? So, but let's see if we can guess what that means, right? If we're vetting fraudulent claims. Well, first, fraudulent is the basically the adjective to form of fraud, and fraud means to fake or lie about something. To so to claim that you had an accident and that the insurance company should pay you but you're lying, you actually maybe created the damage yourself just to get the insurance money, you would be fraudulent, right? That means you are, you are doing fraud. And so the adjective form is fraudulent. You are making a fraudulent claim. And of course, so once we know what that is, to vet a fraudulent claim should be more obvious, right? In this case, to vet means to maybe investigate right or to or to to prove that something is fraudulent or not right so in this case vet used as a verb actually means to investigate or to flesh out to to get all the information about something or to prove that something is wrong or right in this case proving that something is fraudulent right so that you might know, you might know vet as being short for the word veteran, right? But that's as a noun, right? When we use it as a verb, which is the only way we could add ing to it, it is to investigate or to prove something to be good or bad. And of course, I think you could understand, but we can explain where he, he talks about bonding exercises. You, you, in the story, he kind of explains what a bonding exercise is. But just in case you don't know, the verb bond means to, is to it, it is as a noun, it means something that holds two things together. That's what a bond is. When we use it as a verb, it means to hold on to something or to hold fast to something like a string or like a fastener that holds two things together, to hold on to something very closely and very firmly is to bond. In this case, to bond with another person means to create a sort of connection, uh, intimacy with a person that uh, enables you to work better with them. 
So of course the bonding exercise is meant for the, the workers at the retreat to get to know each other better, become closer friends, and then to be bonded in that way, to be into a tight friendship. And of course, he does say that he's already bonded with his son, Charlie, of course. But of course, the bonding exercise is that he can bond with other colleagues. He doesn't have co-workers, he has his own business, but he does have colleagues in the same industry. And so he's going to attend and do bonding exercises. He says that he, it says that he rolled his eyes. Also bonding exercises, and he rolled his eyes. If you don't know what that means, it basically is to be like this. We roll our eyes basically when we're annoyed by something or we're not looking forward to something. So rolled his eyes. In this case, that's giving us the impression that he's not really happy about having to do the bonding exercises. But he seems to have a generally positive attitude about going to this retreat. Okay, and so of course, I guess on with the story, we, we find that the, you know, he explains to his father that he's not a kid anymore. He should be fine on his own while his father is at the retreat. And he goes back to reading his book, the book called Cougar and Dark's Pandemonium Shadow Show. I'm gonna Google that and find out what that book is about. That might be the next book that we read in the, in the book club after this one is finished, I don't know. But let's go on to part two. Although Radar could probably make it up the stairs with the new medicine on board, I went into the little guest room and she patted after me, already perfectly at home in our place. I undressed to my shorts, propped the extra pillow under, under my bed, under my head, and kept reading. On the tape, Mr. Bowditch said there was a huge sundial in a plaza behind a palace, and it turned like the, car like the carousel in the Bradbury novel. And it was the secret of his longevity. The sundial had allowed him to come back to Century's rest young enough to impersonate his own son. In something wicked, the carousel could make you older when it went forward, but younger when it was in reverse. And Mr. Bowditch had said something else, or started to, I'm sure he, never mind. Had he, start, had he started to say that Ray Bradbury had gotten his idea for the carousel from the sundial in that other world? The idea of gaining or losing years on a merry-go-round was crazy, but the idea that a respected American author had visited that other place was even crazier, wasn't it? Bradbury had spent his early childhood in Waukegan, which was less than 70 miles from Century's Rest. A brief visit to Bradbury's Wikipedia entry convinced me that that was just a coincidence, unless he had visited the other world as a little kid. If there was another world, oh, I'll repeat that again. Tone is important, right? If there was another world. Anyway, by the time he was my age, he was living in Los Angeles. I'm sure he, Never mind. I marked my place and put the book on the floor. I was pretty sure Will and Jim wouldn't survive their adventures, but I guess they would never be so innocent again. Kids shouldn't have to face terrible things. I knew that from experience. I got up and pulled on my pants. Come on, Rates. You need to go out and water the grass. He came willingly enough, not limping at all. Oh, she came willingly enough, not limping at all. She'd be lame again in the morning, but after a little exercise, her locomotion would smooth out. At least it had so far. That wouldn't last much longer. If the vet's assistant had been right, she'd said he, she'd, surpri she'd be surprised if Radar made it to Halloween, and that was only five weeks away. A little less, actually. Raid sniffed around on the lawn. I looked up at the stars, picking out Orion's belt and the Big Dipper, an old standby. That old standby, I should say. According to Mr. Bowditch, there were two moons in that other world and constellations the astronomers of Earth had never seen. Not possible, none of it. Yet the well was there and the steps and that horrible fucking bug. I had seen those things. Radar lowered her hindquarters in that delicate way of hers then came to me looking for a treat. 
I gave her half a bond and led her back, led her back inside. I had read late and my dad had gone to bed. It was time for me to do the same. Mr. Bowditch's dog, my dog, plopped down with a sigh and a fart. No more than a tweet, really. I turned off the light and started up into the dark. Tell dad everything. Take him out to the shed. The bug Mr. Bodat shot will, will still be there, some of it anyway. And even if it was gone, the well will be there. This is heavy, so share the load. Would my father keep the secret? Much as I loved him, I didn't trust that he would or could. There are a thousand slogans and mottos in AA, and one of them is, you're only as sick as your secrets. Might he confide to Lindy or a trusted friend at work, his brother, my uncle Bob? Then I remembered something from school, way back in sixth or seventh grade, American history, Miss Greenfield. It was a quote from Benjamin Franklin. Three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. Can you imagine what would happen if people found out there is another world down there? That had been Mr. Bowditch's question, and I thought I knew the answer. It would be taken over, co-opted by the hippy-dippy history teacher would have said. Oh, one more time. It would be taken over Co-opted, my hippy-dippy history teacher would have said. The house at one, at one Sycamore Street would become a top secret government installation. For all I knew, the whole neighborhood would be cleared. And yes, then the exploitation would begin. And if Mr. Bowditch was right, the consequences could be terrible. I finally went to sleep, but dreamed I was awake and something was moving under the bed. I knew in the way of dreams, what it was. A giant roach, one that bit. I woke in a small hour of the, of the morning, convinced it was true. But Radar would have barked, and she was deeply asleep, waffling her way through some unknowable dream of her own. OK. So that was a little bit long, so let's go back. OK, I'm not going to focus so much on, on vocabulary now. We're just going to. You know, talk about what happened here. Basically, okay, he's been, he's trying to read his book, but of course keeps thinking about Miss Bowditch and this portal to the other world and this sundial, of uh, which I may have explained in the past of uh, uh, events, but a sundial is usually some, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a circular object with a little three-dimensional point on it that creates a shadow so that you can tell the time based on the sunlight, the angle of the sun and its sunlight. So the shadow really points the same way that a clock points to the time and you can actually tell the time. So it's basically a clock, but powered by the sun and basically just using the sun's light to create a shadow more than you know a clock would use some kind of mechanics or energy. And uh, this sundial apparently must be big enough to be like a carousel, like something you can actually stand on or sit on and move around in it. I'm not exactly sure what this thing is, but apparently he's, he can't stop thinking about this sundial behind this palace in this other world, right? And hmm, uh, he mentioned something wicked. Actually, he says, in something wicked. You probably wouldn't catch that reference if you're not an, an American uh, native English speaker. Uh, something wicked is a short word for a, a movie called Something Wicked This Way Comes. Uh, and it was actually a book based on a movie, and a, a, big, a, book, a movie based on a book. And I believe, or maybe, I believe so. And the book or story was written by Ray Bradbury, a very famous American author. And I guess he was also a movie director of some kind. And so Ray Bradbury, Ray Bradbury was kind of the Stephen King of his time. There, he kind of suspects that Mr. Bowditch was saying Ray Bradbury had gone to this other world. And that's what inspired him to write about the carousel that changes people's age and something wicked this way comes. I remember seeing that movie. Uh, it was actually quite good, if I recall, but quite. Um, shocking in some ways for me as a child. 
But yeah, I do remember people being on the carousel and getting older as the carousel turned around. That's probably the only thing I can remember. Maybe some lightning bolt is flying around and hitting the carousel at some point. Uh, yeah, so that's that's something that we could have looked into. Uh, let's see. And, okay, well, I think maybe. No, there's no real vocabulary really to talk of talk about here. Uh, I think there was a phrase that. I wanted to discuss, but uh, unfortunately, I can't remember where it was. We're reading in larger and larger chunks now, and so it's harder for me to remember. Okay, here's a word, though, that you might want to put in your lexicon. Locomotion. Now, I would not expect an English speaker who is speaking English as a second language to know the word locomotion, but uh, maybe you can guess because it ends with the, the word motion, right? So motion obviously means the going of some place somewhere or the doing of something motion just means movement right and so locomotion is actually it just means the ability to move right the ability to move um, for example the first train engines were called locomotives because they were you know sort of cargo cargo boxes that had the ability to move so they were locomotive so her locomotion would smooth out it means basically her movement her her ability or her ability to move would smooth out so at first in the morning she would be really stiff and it would be hard for her to walk and stand but then as the day progressed her locomotion or her ability to move smoothly but would, 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 would smooth out right so that's what that means locomotion uh, I think we might have talked about constellations and things like that, but uh, I'm not going to go into that. I think you know what that means. Uh, okay, so yeah, so radar is going to sit down and go to sleep, and uh, thinking about telling his dad. Uh, I was hoping that he would tell his dad, if I'm being honest. I was hoping that he would go on this adventure with his dad, but it looks like he's not going to. Uh, like he says that his uh, that he he rem remembered a, a quote from B Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, said, three may keep a secret if two of them are dead." So basically, that what what that means is, you know, once more than once three people know something, there's no way to keep it a secret. Basically, it's going to spread uh, unless they die with that secret right and then one person can keep it so what what he's basically saying is one person can only one person can keep a secret once you share that secret the secret's out and people will know so it's part and so i guess he's leaning toward not telling his father because his father might have to actually tell someone else as a responsible adult and then the whole world would be coming in, or at least you know the American government would take over, and he just didn't want the town to be ruined by this secret being known. So maybe he has decided not to tell his father. I, I suspect that's what's happened here, but we'll find out as we read on. So we're up to part three, continuing on. On Sunday, I went up to Mr. Bowditch's house to do what I had meant to do the day before, start cleaning the place up. There were some things I couldn't do, of course. The torn cushions and slashed wallpaper would have to wait. There was plenty of other stuff, but I had to take care of it in two separate shifts because the first time I brought radar, and that was a mistake. She went from room to room downstairs looking for Mr. Bowditch. She didn't seem to be upset by the vandalism, but barked furiously at the couch, only pausing to look at me every now and then as if to ask if I was stupid. Couldn't I see what was wrong? Her, master had been, had, her master's bed had disappeared. I got her to follow me into the kitchen and took her down and took her down and told her to. No. One more time. I got her to follow me into the kitchen and told her to down, but she wouldn't, only kept looking toward the living room. I offered her a chicken chip, her favorite snack, but she dropped it onto the linoleum. 
I decided I'd have to take her back home and leave her with dad. But when she saw the leash, she ran very limberly through the living room and up the stairs. I found her in Mr. Bowditch's bedroom, curled up in front of the closet on a makeshift bed of clothes that had been torn off their hangers. She seemed okay there. So I went back downstairs and made things as much better as I could. Around 11 o'clock, I heard the click of her nails on the stairs. Seeing her hurt, hurt my heart. She was limping, but she moved slowly with her head down and her tail drooping. She looked at me with an expression as clear as words. Where is he? Come on, girl, I said. Let's get you out of here. That time, she didn't protest the leash. Okay, so he went to the, Mr. Bowditch's house to do some chores. He's bought the dog, but the dog was very distracted because he was being in the same house again. He was expecting to see Mr. Bowditch. She was expecting to see Mr. Bowditch. And so she's looking around so much. And at some point, I guess she gives up and maybe realizes Mr. Bowditch is not coming back and then happily goes back, or at least doesn't resist going back to Charlie's house, which I guess she's starting to realize is going to be her new home, and that Mr. Bowditch may be gone for good, or forever. Okay, um, that was a short one, so there's really not so much vocabulary that I can teach to. Obviously, this word limberly, I would, I would recommend that you guess that, right? It says It says that but when she saw the leash, she ran very limberly through the living room. Like, can you guess what limberly means? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it comes from the adjective limber. So we would look that up. Basically, if you're guessing something, anything like flexible or with a good range of motion, then that's what limber means. And so to do something limberly is to do something smoothly or with a good range of motion as if it's easy to do, which is surprising because she's an old dog and she's got arthritic legs, but you know she has energy now because she wants to find her old master. And so she has a boost of energy and is able to run away limberly through the living room and up the stairs. Okay, let's go on to number four. In the afternoon, I did what I could with the upstairs. The little man in the white socks cap and corduroy pants, assuming it was him, which I did, hadn't done any damage on the third floor, at least that I could see. I thought he'd concentrated his attention on the second floor and on the safe once he found it. He'd have been keeping an eye on the, on the, on the time too, nothing that funerals, knowing that funeral services only last so long. I gathered up my clothes and put them in a little pile at the head of the stairs, meaning to take them home. Then I went to work on Mr. Bowditch's bedroom, riding the bed, which had been not turned over, rehanging his clothes, tucking in pockets as I went, and picking up stuffing from the pillows. I was angry at Mr. Right O, oh, ha ha, for what seemed almost like a de the de desecration of the dead, but I couldn't help thinking of some of the sorry crap I'd pulled with Betty Bird, dog shit on windshields, firecrackers and mailboxes, full garbage cans overturned, Jesus jerks off, spray painted on the signboard of Grace Methodist Church. We had never been caught, and yet I had. Looking at the mess Mr. Ha Ha had left behind and hating it, I realized I had caught myself. Back then, I'd been a, as bad as the little man with the funny way of walking and talking. Worse, in some ways. The little man, at least, had a motive. He'd been looking for gold. Miss, the, the bird man and I had just been a couple of kids fucking off and fucking up. Except, of course, the bird man and I had never killed anyone. If I was right about Mr. Ha Ha had, oh, if I was right, Mr. Ha Ha had. Okay. Except, of course, the bird man and I had never killed anyone. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Going back. I'm sorry. We're, we're on to the next paragraph. Sorry. Here we go. One of the bedroom bookcases had been overturned, 
I set it upright and started reshelving the books. At the bottom of the pile was that scholarly looking tome I'd seen on his nightstand, along with the Bradbury novel I was currently reading. I picked it up and looked at the cover, a funnel filling with stars, the origins of fantasy and its place in the world matrix. What a mouthful. And Jungian perspectives to boot. I looked in the index to see if there was anything about the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. Turned out there was. I tried to read it, then just scanned it. It was everything I hated about what I thought of as a hoity-toity academic writing, full of $5 words and tortured syntax. Maybe that's intellectual laziness on my part, but maybe not. So far, so far as I could make out, the author of that particular chapter was saying there was actually two Beanstalk stories, the bloodthirsty original and the sanitized version kids got in moon mom approved little golden books and the feature length cartoon. The bloodthirsty original bifurcated, no, the bloodthirsty original bifurcated, there's one of your $5 words into the mythic streams, one dark and one light. The dark one had to do with the joys of plunder and murder, as, as in Jack chopping down the beanstalk and the giant getting smooshed. Okay. Cool. Okay. The light one had to do with what the writer called the epistemology of Wittgensteinian re religious belief. And if you know what that one means, even with its headlights on, you are a better man than I. I put the book on the shelf left the room, then went back again to look at the cover. The inside was full of trudging prose, compound, complex sentences that allowed the eye no rest. But the, uh, the cover was a little lyric, uh, as, perfect as, in the, uh, as perfect in its way as that William Carlos Williams poem about the red wheelbarrow, a funnel fi filling with stars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now this one, wow, it was a tough section to read, very tough section to read, very wordy, very dense with words, right? But basically, even though there are all these words that you may not understand, we can understand what basically happened here, right? He went to clean up Mr. Bowditch's room, he was picking up Mr. Bowditch's bookshelf and putting the books on the shelf. When he found a couple of books that interested him, he read... Uh, it, it was, it, it, he started to look into one, uh, one called The Origins of Fantasy and Its Place and Its Place in the World, in the World Matrix, and Jungian Perspectives. Basically, what I guess it's one book or two books, I'm not able to tell, but these are basically psychology books by Jungian. Jungian actually is, is, is the, it, it, it relates to the name of, of the, the man whose name is Carl Jung, who they say is one of the fathers of modern psychology. And uh, so he did a lot of work on psychology and he basically, it looks like it's some kind of analysis of fairy tales from a, so, a psychological perspective. That, that looks like that's what this book is. So he says it's hoity-toity which is hoity-toity is just sort of a slang way of saying it's highbrow. I hated it, but I hated, wait, it says it was everything I hated about what I thought of as hoity-toity academic writing. Hoity-toity means high, highbrow, high level, maybe even snobbish <laughs> academic writings, full of $5 words, right? $5 words, basically $5 words, <laughs> You might not be able to guess what that means, right? There's just no way. But basically, what would happen, I, I, I guess, this is my understanding of it. My understanding is that people, you know, the everyday vocabulary that you learn, uh, you, you can just learn from speaking English, walking down the street, talking to your family members who speak English, right? You can get words every day. That's your everyday words. But a $5 word basically is what he's saying is a word that you have to pay for. That means it's a word that people don't use every day. You would have to pay and have someone teach you this word, right? So we often call these quote words big words, very specialized words, $5 words. And he even mentions that again, right, when he talks about the, the bloodthirsty original bifurcated, right? 
what does bifurcated mean, right? That's not a usual word, right? And so he's, that's why he's saying, yeah, there's one of your $5 words. So the word bifurcated is what is, a, is such a word that you would have to pay to, to get and learn and that you seem more intelligent. The word bifurcated actually just means to split into two or to go into two different directions, to split into two parts or to go into two different directions. So he's basically saying the fairy tales bifurcated, they split into two directions. One was sort of like the children books direction and the other one was in what, what is called in the book, the epistemology of Wittgensteinian religious belief, okay? Now, he even says, if you know, he says, if you know what that means, even with the headlights on, with its headlights, with, with its headlights on, you're a better man than I. Basically, what he's saying is if you can understand what those words mean, well, you are you're better than me. Even with its headlights on, basically is to say, even with your best attention, right? We don't usually say that, but that's what he means to say, even with its headlights on. You could actually see, if you can imagine a car in the dark, you can't see it. Or or you or being in a car and you're you're in the dark and you can't see outside. But when you turn the headlights on, you can see more clearly. So he's saying even with its headlights on, you still don't know what this one means. You still can't see it. You can't understand it. Of so that's a bit of slang that you don't really need to know and you won't have to use. So basically all that's happened is he was cleaning up Mr. Bowditch's room and he found a book or two books, maybe. Okay, so going on, number five. On Monday, I went to see my old pal, Mr. Silvius in the office and asked her if I could take, oh, so one more time, I got the Mr. wrong. On Monday, I went to see my old pal, Mrs. Silvius, in the office and asked her if I could take my, my once a semester community service day on Tuesday. She leaned over the desk toward me and spoke in a low, confidential voice. Do I smell a boy who wants to play hooky? I only ask because students are asked to give at least one week's notice before they take their in-service day. Not a requirement, Charlie, but a strong suggestion. No, this is the real deal, I said, making earnest eye contact. It was a useful technique when telling lies that I had learned from, from Bertie Berg. One more time. I'm going to read that sentence one more time. Notice the difference if I read it with the correct tone. It was a useful technique when telling lies. That I had learned from Bertie Berg. I'm going around to downtown merchants and pitching them on, on an adopt a. Or adopt a, adopt a. Adopt a, Miss Sylvius looked interested in spite of herself. Well, it's usually adopt a highway. I got into that with key clubs, key club. But I want to go farther, get store owners interested in adopt a park. We've actually got six of them, you know, and adopt an underpass. So many of them are messes. It's really a shame. Maybe even adopt a vacant lot. If I can convince, I get the drift. She grabbed the form and scribbled on it. Take this around to your teachers, get a sign off from all of them, bring it back to me. And as I left, Charlie, I still smell hooky. I smell it all over you. I wasn't exactly lying about my community service project, but I was shading the truth about needing a day off from school to do it. During period five, I went to the library got a JC's booklet listing all the downtown merchants and sent out an e-blast, just changing the salutations and the names of the various adopter projects I'd thought up. I took half an hour, which left me with 20 minutes before the chime announcing the change of classes. I went back to the desk and asked Miss, Miss Norman if she, if she had Grimm's fairy tales. The actual book wasn't in the library, so she handled me a Kindle with property of Hillview High demo typed on the back and gave me the one use only code to download the book. I didn't read any of the fairy tales, only ran down the contents and skimmed the introduction. It was interesting, but not entirely surprised to find that, oh, I was interested, but not entirely surprised 
to find that most of the ones I knew from childhood had darker versions. The original of Goldilocks and the Three Bears was an oral tale that had been around since the 1500s, and there was no little girl named Goldilocks in it. The main character was a vile old woman who invaded the bear's home, basically broke all their shit, then jumped out of the window and ran away into the woods, cackling. Rumpelstiltskin was even worse. In the version I vaguely remembered, old Rumpel fell away in, the, in, in a huff when the girl tasked him with spinning straw into gold guessed his name. In the 1857 version of Grimm's, he drove one foot into the ground, grasped the other, and tore himself apart. I thought that was a horror story worthy of the Saw, of the Saw franchise. Period six was a single semester course called America Today. I had no idea what Mr. Mesensick, Mes, I had no idea what, what Mr. Mesensick was saying. I was thinking about make-believe, how the carousel, something wicked, in how the carousel in something wicked was like the sundial in that land of the other, land of other, for instance. The secret of my longevity, Mr. Bowditch had said, Jack had stolen gold from the giant. Mr. Bowditch had also stolen gold from who or what? A giant? Some pulp fiction demon named Gog Magog? Once my mind started down this path, I saw similarities everywhere. My mother had died on a bridge spanning the Little Rumble River. And what about the little man with the funny voice? Wasn't that how the story described Rumpelstiltskin? And then there was me. How many stories of make-believe featured a young hero like Jack on a quest in a fantastic land? Or take the Wizard of Oz, where a tornado lifted a little girl out of canvas into a world of witches and munchkins. I wasn't Dorothy and Radar wasn't Toto, but... Charles, have you fallen asleep back there? Or perhaps my mellifluous voice has hypnotized you, entranced you. Laughter from the class, most of whom wouldn't have known mellifluous from a piss hole in the snow. No, I'm right here. Then perhaps you give us your considered opinion concerning the blue on black shootings of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling. Bad shit, I said. I was still mostly in my own head and it just popped out of my mouth. Mr. Mazensnick, oh, Mr. Mazens, Ma Mr. Ma Mazensnick, Mr. Mazensnick, no, Mr. Mazensick, Mr. Mazensick, that's his name. Mr. Mazensick favored me with his tra trademark thin smile. Thin said, bad shit indeed. Please feel free to re-enter your trance state, Mr. Reed. He continued his lecture. I tried to pay attention, but then I thought of something Mrs. Silvius had said. Not fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman, but I still smell hooky. I smell it all over you. Surely a coincidence. My father said, if you thought a blue car, if you bought a blue, no, no, no more. My father said, if you bought a blue car, you saw blue cars everywhere. But after what I'd seen in the shed, I couldn't help wondering. And something else, in a fantasy story, the author would invent some way that the young hero or heroine could explore that world. I was st starting to think of as the other. The author might, for instance, invent a, re invent a retreat his parents or parent, his parent or parents had to attend for several days, thus clearing the day for the young hero to visit the other world without provoking a hunch, a bunch. That, one more time. Thus clearing the, the way for the young hero to visit the other world without provoking a bunch of questions he couldn't answer. Coincidence? I thought as the class ending chime went and kids bolted from the door, for the door. Blue car syndrome. Except the giant roach was no blue car and neither were those stone steps winding down into the dark. I got Mr. Mason Nick, Mason Snick. I got Mr. Mason Sick. I got Mr. Mason Sick to sign my community service slip. And he gave me his thin smile. Bad shit, eh? Sorry, sorry. Actually, you weren't wrong. I made my escape and headed for my locker. Charlie? It was Arnetta Freeman, looking relatively gorgeous in her skinny jeans and shell top. 
With blue eyes and blonde hair down to her shoulders, Arnetta proved that white America ain't all bad. The year before, <laughs> when I'd been more sporty and at least a little bit famous for my turkey bowl heroics, Arnetta and I had spent several study sessions in her basement family room. Some studying had been done, but a lot more making out. Hey, Arnie, what's up? Do you want to come over tonight? We could study for the Hamlet test, those blue eyes looking deep into my brown ones. I'd love to, but my dad's leaving for most of the rest of the week tomorrow, some kind of business thing. I better stick around. Oh, poo, that's a shame. She hugged two books tenderly to her breasts. I could, I could Wednesday night, if you're not busy, that is. She brightened. That would be fantastic. She took my hand and placed it on her waist. I'll quiz you on Polonius. And maybe you can check out my Wartenbras. She gave me a peck on the cheek, then walked away, backside switching in a way that was, well, bewitching. For the first time since the library, I was thinking about real world parallels to make believe ones. My mind was on nothing but Arnetta Freeman. Okay. I think that was difficult. That was a very difficult read. Uh, again, very long sentences, very dense, uh, very, dim, very dense uh, paragraphs, uh, very long paragraphs, and some a few big words. For this one, you uh, you'd really have to be here in this book club to ask questions about this. With something like this, I would have taken a much longer time, maybe even stopping between paragraphs to explain what what was said like for example when he said adopt a and then that was later brought to mean a short for adopt a park or adopt a highway or adopt a, an underpass or adopt a vacant lot basically when we say adopt a that comes from a program that came out i guess in the 70s maybe where uh, people were encouraged to donate their time and money to fixing something by saying that they are adopting it. So the organization would call itself adopt a something. And then people would join that organization and they would volunteer their time and money to cleaning that place or thing. So it's almost like adopting a dog, right? You adopt a dog, maybe if there's a stray dog that's been rescued, has no owner, you can adopt that dog. It means you make that dog your own. Well, in this case, we're, there's a program, a volunteer program, where you adopt other things around the town that need to be fixed or maintained. So you adopt a highway. You, you, the people get together and donate time and money to fixing up or cleaning up the highway or something like that. So that's what adopta is. And his excuse for being able to leave school uh, for one day was that he's going to do volunteer work or, or do research into starting an adopt a program, which means a program for adopting many places around Century's Rest, this place that they live. Okay, so that's one thing I would have stopped to explain before continuing on if you were here. There were also things like, you know, you, you, I, JC's booklet. Okay, I don't know what JC is. I'm guessing that JC is the name of, of uh, I guess, the name of a, of a booklet. I, I guess when we look it up, what came up there? A member of a junior chamber of commerce, a civic organization of business and community leader. So I don't think that's related. I think JC's booklet is basically a booklet. Well, maybe it is. It's a booklet that's, that, that, that tells about that tells you about the, all the businesses in the area. So maybe that is what it is, and that and so he wanted to find out all of the areas, all the businesses in the area, so he could approach them with his adopter project. Uh, of course, that's something he could do in just the one hour in the library, but he's he want, he needs to do that so that he can cover his excuse for taking Tuesday off. I'm assuming Tuesday he wants to go on an adventure down the well. We can't be sure, right? And then he asked Miss Miss Norman, who was a librarian, if she can borrow uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales. Grimm's Fairy Tales is, is a book that's the source of many, if not most, of the great fairy tales uh, that, that you see told by Disney and so on, and uh, that are told to children. 
uh, when they are at story time, right? So though he mentioned a few fairy tales. If you don't know those fairy tales, it's not so important. For example, he mentioned Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You may maybe that fairy tale was told to you in your native language. Uh, maybe not. It's the tale of a little girl with golden golden hair, blonde hair. Uh, the Goldilocks. Her name was Goldilocks because she had blonde hair. Golden and locks means hair. And um, you know, she went into the, a bear's house and you know she she tried their food and she slept in their beds and basically that was a cute tale where you know she. She falls asleep in the bed, bed, and the bears come home, and then she runs away. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it's an innocent story, uh, but he's noticing that tales like Goldilocks and tales like Rumpelstiltskin, of uh, which is was a, a small like elf-like character who could grant wishes, of uh, but uh, but he could he would bind the people he, he granted wishes to to some horrible task, of uh, that they could not get free from unless they could guess his name. And of course, Rumpelstiltskin is a name that no one would guess somehow. The, the main character guesses his name and he because someone finally guessed his name, it, it basically you know, makes him angry. And in this case, he's saying the dark version is that he pulls himself apart. So what he's noticing basically about all of this is that Fairy tales that are told to children have a light way, light manner, but actually, you know, the, the real fairy tales as they were originally told were quite dark and scary and, and dangerous. Hey, Google, turn on living room light, please. So that's you know, that's basically what's happening now, right? He's, he's just thinking about this, how fairy tales of uh, or tend to be dark and he's also noticing how there are certain things that are happening in his life that are sort of related to fairy tales like oh like this this well that leads to a secret world is so much like jack and the beanstalk where jack chops down the beanstalk and kills the giant that they have their violent aspects to them but there are many themes that happen in, in fairy tales that are actually occurring in his life like when Jack and the Beanstalk goes up to the, the, the this, this other world, right, to steal the giant's gold, the giant can smell him. And the giant says, fee, fi, fo, fum, right? I smell the, the, I smell the blood of an Englishman, I think is what he says, right? And of course, that's, you know, he, he's kind of relating that, that to maybe the similarity of what, you know, the principle saying that, you know, I smell hooky on you, right? Do you remember that? She said, I still smell hooky on you. For example, he gave a very good excuse for taking a day off from school, but she, what she's saying is she didn't believe it. She still smells hooky. And hooky, by the way, if you don't know, to play hooky is to not go to school to stay home from school but without telling anyone. So you don't tell your parents, you don't go to school, you just go off and you play with your friends, do something else, but you just don't go to school that day. That's playing hooky. So she's saying, I smell hooky on you, meaning that I think you wanna take the day off to, do, to, get a, to get into some other adventure, not just to do some volunteer work, right? So that, that came up. Um, another phrase that came up, dimotaped. It, it's not important, right? I, I don't know what that means, dimotaped. But it says, she handed me a Kindle with property of Hillview High, diamond taped to the back. So I imagine that a Kindle is a tablet that's used, used for reading ebooks. But on the back of the tablet, there must be, I guess, dimotaped is that you know how you have this tape and you can print characters, letters onto the tape and then stick the tape onto something and you could label things that way? Maybe Dymo tape is what that was called or what some name brand of that ver of that tape, where you, a label maker, where you can sort of press characters into the tape or print characters on the tape and then, you, and then adhere the tape to something. To label something. So obviously, demo tape is some type of label. I would guess that, right? I've never seen or heard the name demo tape, but I can guess that meaning, and hopefully you can as well. 
And then, of course, while he's pondering all the similarity of his life to fairy tales and how so many things seem fairy tale like, uh, similar to fairy tales in his life, uh, when he's told to answer a question by his teacher. Uh, and of course, then as he's leaving his classroom, of uh, an old flame, an old girlfriend of his, beautiful girl, blonde hair, blue eyes, wants to have a study date with him. And he is very familiar with her because he always used to, back when he was a jock or an athlete, you know, in the school sports teams and very popular, they used to get together and they used to study together. And of course, studying together was always an excuse for making out, right? You get together to make out. So now, make out, uh, what that means, if, if you don't know, and you probably do, but to make out, that's what young people say when they say, you know, kissing, touching, embracing, hugging, holding, all the things that you do that's not sex, not including sex, but what's sexual, you know, having fun, uh, petting each other, touching each other, and doing things, you know, that you only do in the dark, right, with, with each other. But usually when we say make out, it, does, it doesn't mean to go as far as sex. When we say make love, that usually means sex. But when we say make out, and that usually is just, you know, just kissing, some maybe some heavy petting, maybe a little hand under the shirt action or something like that, but not much more than that, right? What kids would do. And uh, okay, and so he agrees to go to her house on Wednesday to study, and that's a good thing. And that's the way that ended. All right. So now we're, we don't have much time, but this next section is quite small, so I'll just read that and then we'll say goodbye. So number six. My dad left bright and early on Tuesday morning, carrying his traveling bag and wearing his I'm going to the woods clothes, corduroy pants, flannel shirt, bear's hat. He carried a poncho slung over one shoulder. Rain in the forecast, he said. That'll put the kibosh on any tree climbing, which I'm not worried. I'm not sorry. Club soda at cocktail hour? No, one more time. Club soda at cocktail hour, right? He grinned. Maybe with a slice of lime. Not to worry, kiddo. Lindy will be there, and I'll stick with him. Take care of the dog. She's limping again. I know. He gave me a quick one-armed squeeze and a kiss on the jaw. As he backed down the driveway, I held up my hand in a, st a stop gesture and ran to the driver's side window. He lowered it. Did I forget something? No, I did. I leaned in, hugged him around the neck, and kissed his cheek. <laughs> he gave me a puzzled smile. What was that for? I just love you, that's all. Same here, Charlie. He patted my cheek, backed into the street, and took off toward the goddamn bridge. I watched him go until he was out of sight. I guess that down deep, I knew something. Okay, all right, so all right, we can stop there. This is a good place to stop. That last thing, down deep, I knew something. What he, what does that mean? What does, he, what does that mean when he says, down deep, I knew something? When we say down deep or deep down, what that means is in our unconscious mind, something that's mo motivating us, but we're not really quite aware of consciously, you know, like in the back of our mind, it's motivating us, but we're not really personally conscious, consciously aware of it. So we say deep down or down deep. So he says, I guess that down deep, I knew something. So what that is, is more foreshadowing, right? What he's saying as a storyteller is that he said he kissed his father goodbye and, or said he loved his father and hugged his father as if he knew something, like he, as if he knew that maybe it would be the last time he would see his father or as if he knew something bad might happen to his father or maybe as if he knew something bad might happen to him, right? So 
what he's doing by saying that I knew something, and that's why I said a, such an emotional goodbye, is he's foreshadowing what's to come, right? So the adventure is about to begin, true dangers await, and it looks like it's going to be without his father. It looks like he's saying goodbye to his father, and he's going to go on this adventure alone. So that's a great place to start. Next time, we've got a nice long section to read, so we'll do that next time. Uh, we got a late start. Uh, usually, we start these at three o'clock. I'm gonna. I'm thinking about moving them to three fifteen because my schedule has gotten tighter. But in any event, you know, please do continue to check out the web page. And you know, every Wednesday, I'm going to be reading this. Uh, anytime after that Wednesday evening, usually by the next day, the stream is available to watch. And it's a good idea just to you know read along and uh, listen to the pronunciation, you know, play, stop. You know, if you hear a sentence that sounds really, really difficult to pronounce, I mean, you can play that and, and stop and then try to shadow what I've read. I often make mistakes in my reading. This reading is quite high level for someone who's even for a native speaker. So it, the fact that I'm stumbling to read these sentences, I want you to see that this is not if you are doing this, you are doing something that's hard for native speakers to do. And so you should feel proud that you're challenging yourself, or you should feel good that you're challenging yourself. Uh, and, and therefore, you know that you're improving your English. If you're not challenging yourself, you're not improving, right? If you're just taking tests and answering questions, knowing the answer to questions is not improving, right? The, having the vocabulary is not improving. The most important thing is that you're doing things that are improving your English, expanding your vocabulary, uh, increasing your fluency. So, you know, if you think that this book club, this book club might help, then by all means, join next time. And if you want to join any of our other book clubs, I have another one coming up in about three hours, uh, and that one is open to all. So you could just you know, contact us by comment or, you know, just fill in the uh, contact form at the bottom of this web page. And uh, you can sign up and you can, you're able to join. The price is about 2,200 yen. It would be half if you join the Real English Party just by becoming a member, which you can still do for free. Uh, there's another book, part, book club tomorrow. The book club tomorrow is Wednesday. So, so tonight's book club is a little lower level, like a much lower level, much easier read than today. And then tomorrow's book club is a kind of intermediate, not as difficult as this, but not as easy as tonight's. So by all means, do challenge yourself. This is the only one that's being made available by live stream, but you, you're welcome to attend any of the others or any of our other events. We've got Christmas parties coming up at Norton Place, uh, I think, uh, we're, we're doing a, a, a meet and greet and mix and mingle and smile at Smiles this Friday, a, a new restaurant, Indian restaurant opened by a friend of mine. Uh, and so we're going to have a mix and mingle meet and greet there. You can sign up to join for that. Uh, we still have, we have another song event coming out. Last weekend's song event was interesting. We, we sang uh, Nada So So. Um, we didn't sing it, no. We we translated Nada So So and discussed, you know, the, the lyrics. And by the end of the by the end of that that event, uh, it was wow, so emotional because once you understand what the lyrics are about, then wow, you know, it's 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 emotional to listen to. So yeah, yeah. There's so many events that we have, and if there's any kind of event that you can think of, if you want to gather with your friends and do something other than read a book or play English games or have drinks and eat, whatever you can think of to do that includes English, contact us. We'll be ha happy to host that party for you. Uh, but that's it for now. We've gone pretty late, and so I hope anyone who's who stuck in this long, I really appreciate it. And uh, well, I guess. The live stream ends there, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.